everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, and uh, great to see everybody here. Uh, I had a chance to catch up with some old friends as well. Sorry to take you away from all the discussions that's happening. I thought that's the value of the kind of forum that we have to exchange uh, practices and exchange uh, uh, lessons on safety. But we do have to get on with the business and I do have a speech today. So if you will, uh, bear with me. So WSH Council Members, Mr. Dayton, Chairman of the WSH Council Logistics and Transport Committee, and also the Singapore Logistics Association. Committee members and industry representatives, ladies and gentlemen, Good morning and thank you for joining the, w, uh, the Workplace Safety and Health Forum for the Logistics and Transport Industry. Today's forum aims to rally the industry to improve WSH further, including nurturing a workplace culture where workers feel safe to speak up on WSH issues. I reflect on my own WSH journey with Singapore's where I'm from. We have, as you know, uh, more than a thousand postmen on the roads every day operating individually. And we've had our fair share of issues. We are the largest uh, bicycle or motorbike fleet uh, out there. And we have, uh, I'm always constantly worried about the hazards that we face. So we encourage them to speak up, report near misses, hazards, share the lessons with their team members so that we can all learn from each other. I must say, it is not easy because people feel shy, sometimes they're hesitant to report, but we must encourage them to do so, and we encourage them that it is worthwhile and they will not be blamed no matter what they say. This is because the benefits of sharing and reporting so that everybody learns can prevent accidents and it can save lives. This sort of culture is needed for the transportation and storage industry, which has one of the highest numbers and rates of fatal and major injuries compared to other industries. The situation actually worsened during the heightened safety period of HSP. The annualized fatal and major injury rate for the industry increased from 24 per 100,000 workers between January to August 2022, which is pre HSP, to 29.5 between September 22 and March 23, which is during HSP. This is of grave concern, so we must improve our WSH. Additionally, the Ministry of Manpower has scheduled enforcement operations focusing on vehicular safety from August 2023 to ensure that those who are behind in WSH step up. I also call upon the more progressive companies or members we will have a chance to speak about some of them later from the industry to support our peers, reminding them of the importance of WSH and even sharing with them the good practices that we have. I was glad to learn that some companies have already incorporated good WSH reporting practices. For example, Jerome Port provides a platform for workers and port users to report near misses conveniently through their mobile devices, and it also ensures anonymity. In one case, workers reported a metal piece protruding from a yard. A safety cone was immediately placed to prevent tripping, and the hazard was removed the next day. Good practices like this does help save lives and these must continue. After three long years of not being able to physically celebrate logistics and transport companies and individuals for their commitment to WSH, I am glad that we are able to honour several of our industry colleagues here today. We will be presenting the WSH Innovation Awards and WSH Awards for Supervisors for the industry. I thank the SLA for their continued support for these industry awards. And as we recognize these best practices, I hope the industry will be inspired and motivated to learn from one another. For the WSH Innovation Awards, there are 10 winners who have incorporated innovations to improve WSH. Let me cite one of our award recipients today. PSA Singapore, recipient of the Gold Award, had adopted prime mover telematics to observe and monitor the prime mover drivers driving here. Using telematics, PSA would identify those who exhibited, uh, exhibit unsafe driving behaviour and follow up with coaching. Those with high scores accumulated over time are also required to attend remedial intervention programme to prevent accidents from occurring. This is one good way to utilise WSH innovations to enhance WSH outcomes. For the WSH Awards for Supervisors, it recognizes exemplary individuals that act as a bridge between senior management and workers. Let me share how one supervisor kept his workers safe. 
Mohammad Fauzi bin Jamal, a Depo garaging supervisor from SMRP buses, constantly encourages his workers to prioritize safety by conducting daily safety moments. He emphasizes the day's safety message and impresses on them the safety is everyone's responsibility. Further to encouraging his workers to look out for and report unsafe conditions, Fauzi assures his workers that their safety concerns are being heard to Good job, Fauzi, and I urge all supervisors to play their part in ensuring safety on the ground. One hot spot for the transportation and storage industry has been vehicular safety. It has high risk of serious injury. Since 2022 up to March this year, there were 9 fatal injuries and 10 major injuries. MOM found that common causes included inadequate traffic management plans or non-compliance to such plans. In light of this, I urge everyone to pay close attention to vehicular safety. The WSH Council will continue to support companies in managing vehicular safety. We understand that SMEs may face difficulties in implementing things like innovations. SMEs can start simple, it doesn't have to be difficult. We are curating the SME pack on vehicular safety, which contains bite-sized versions of WSH resources such as brochures, checklists, and posters. And these resources will be made available in English, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil. These will be released by the end of the month. This pack is the first in the series of four to be released over the next few months, so do look out for it. Next, we have updated the WSH guidelines for safe loading and unloading of vehicles. The guidelines have been revised by an industry working group that was convened in 2021 under the guidance of the WSH Council's LNT Committee. I thank the working group and committee for your valuable insights and Mr. Eric Law, chairman of the working group, will share the key revisions later. Thank you, Eric. Both these resources are available for download on the WSH Council's website, so please do share them with your colleagues and your workers. In conclusion, all of us, employees and employers, need to put in your best efforts to WSH. Grow your WSH ownership, adopt WSH innovations, and implement best practices, such as introducing an internal reporting system if your company does not work. All workers deserve to go home safe and healthy. Thank you. Here's wishing you, wishing everybody safe operations and a fruitful following day. Thank you very much. We would now like to welcome our first speaker for the forum, Mr. Perry Hung, Principal Manager from the Wish Council. Mr. Hung will share with you the principles and example measures from the approved code of practice for chief executives and board of directors wish duties. The approved code of practice is designed to help companies and their leaders meet obligations in section 48 of the wish act, which holds corporate officers liable for wish lapses. Mr. Hung, please. everyone. Congratulations to all the award winners earlier. I'm here to talk to you about the code of practice for the Chief Executives and Board of Directors WSH duties, which was launched last September and uh, gazetted in October. So it's been a while now, almost a year, so some of you might have heard this before, but please bear with me. So um, the code of practice over here, uh, when it was launched, I think uh, it triggered some, some reaction from the industry. People were shocked, like, oh, does this mean that um, this, this uh, document, this piece of document is going to be used to come after bosses? Like, are we telling bosses that like, these are your responsibilities now, please do something about it? But the answer is no, because in the WSH Act, uh, since 2006, it's already been specified in Section 48. So if you can... The laser pointer is not very clear. Uh, the top box is a screenshot of the WSH Act where it says a corporate officer will have has got uh, will be liable for for prosecution if there has been an offence under the WSH Act, which means to say if somebody has died in the course of work or got severely injured, there will be investigations that ensues, and then um, prosecution may, prosecution may take place. And during the course of investigation, if it has been found 
that somebody in the top management had willfully caused, uh, uh, contributed to this accident, then they can be, they can be prosecuted accordingly. So um, that's what the box in the green says where um, the, of the officer will not be guilty if they can prove that the accident had happened without their permission without, uh, and they had exercised all due diligence. So we have this phrase, all due diligence, where it's a little bit vague, but I will explain a bit more over here. So the code of practice is a document that is that sets out to provide a bit more clear clarity on what all due, all due diligence might be. So um, we've uh, extensively consulted the industry, we've talked to associations and different bodies, and then these are a collection of all the different measures that the industry is doing when it comes to, uh, when it comes to top management uh, exercising their due, due diligence. So. Broadly speaking, there are four principles in the code, and each of these principles has got associated measures. Um, the total tallies up to 17. And whether uh, whether the top management, whether a boss of a company has followed um, the principle is shown by by the uh, measures that they have implemented. But these are only examples that we've collected from the industry. It's not the be all and all. Uh, in fact, when it comes to the code, it, what the boss should do is try and embody the four principles as much as possible and not pay so much attention to the 17 measures. It's not as though if you have all 17 measures, then you're all clear because that's not the intent of this document. So these are just examples. They are non-exhaustive and they apply to all companies regardless of the industry and regardless of the size of the company. So I have a couple of examples over here. So in this case, um, um, this CEO was prosecuted back in 2021, two years ago, because uh, in his laboratory, which was under his care, an, an explosion happened and it killed a chemist and injured several other lab workers. So what was found was that um, there were the HIC department found out that there were some things that need to be addressed, but then the boss had had um, put it off. So so what were, what they were suggesting to to uh, address those hazards. Uh, he had deliberately uh, said, okay, let's wait for the next time and then the accident happened and, and uh, because of that, he was found culpable to, uh, to have led to the accident happening, so he was prosecuted. I have another um, example over here which will give you a bit of understanding of what an ACOB is. So it is an expressway um, that was under construction some years back and um, during the course of construction, there were some cracks that were found. So, um, if some of you would be familiar with risk management, so uh, the risk management code of practice says that whenever you discover something new that might compromise safety, you should take immediate action, right? It's not just review your risk assessment every three years. So, the crack in, in the structure means that it can compromise safety, but um, the people, the crew involved, they had chose not to take action and not address the crack, and then it collapsed, which killed a worker and injured 10 others. So this company, uh, the court has deemed that the company deviated from the code of practice of risk management and therefore uh, meted out a hundred, uh, a million dollar fine. So from here on out, I'll be talking about the four principles and it's 17 measures. It's going to be a bit dry, but I'll do my best to keep it short. So we, the four principles are abbreviated with the letters C, O, R, and E. These, uh, this abbreviation was chosen because these four principles are meant to be the core values that every boss should embody when running their company. So the first one is about C, clarity. So we've only got two measures over here and the idea is to make very clear who in the top management uh, will be responsible when it comes to safety and health. So number one is about assigning and documenting the WSH roles and responsibility in the top, top management, which can include the board of directors. So. Um, if it's a big company and you have an elected board, then you can it can be discussed amongst uh, the top management who will take this up, or it can be everybody. So it's not about um, whether. It, so the idea over here is to make clear because you want not just the top management to know who amongst themselves, but also communicate this with the entire company so that everybody knows who to turn to whenever there's a safety and health uh, safety and health matter to raise. Number two is about setting the WSH policy goals and standards for the company. So in steering the company, you also want to steer the WSH direction. 
So broadly speaking, for the logistics company, it can be about um, minimizing uh, uh, collisions with vehicles, it can be about fatigue. If you have drivers who, who um, do long hours, then it can be about managing fatigue. Then we come to organizational culture, which has got seven measures. Um, number three is related to measure number two, so we're talking about setting the goals. So number three will be to commit to those goals by publishing what you have. So if you have a goal, you are going to lay down um, achievable steps and along the way KPI. So publish those so that your company employees know what is it that they're working towards. So it is about minimizing um, traffic accidents in the workplace or, or collisions with pedestrians. Then uh, you can set KPI and track them, monitor them and publish them so that everyone uh, uh, is kept aware about it. And measure number four is to set WSH as a regular agenda. So when you have um, this agenda uh, periodically put into your management uh, meetings, so it's going to keep the management engaged and involved in the WSH conversation throughout as they run. So, so it should not be like every three years when you review your RA, then you talk about this review and, and then you table it at a management meeting. If it's going to be convened quarterly, just set aside 10-15 minutes to talk about safety and health at a management meeting. Measure number five is about making sure that you have enough resources to look after this aspect of work, your safety and the health of your employees. So the resources can come in the form of time, it can be manpower, it can be money. So not only do you want to set, a, set aside a budget to procure safer equipment or PPE, uh, you also want to make sure that your manpower, the, your employees are well trained, they go for training, and then you also make sure that the time set aside for them is protected. So they're not going to be that the training is going to be not going to be pushed aside just because a new project has come up. And whenever you have a project, you always consider like, is there enough time for the work to be completed safely? And measure number six is related to measure number one. So we talked about wanting to make sure everybody knows who to turn to when it, when it comes to safety and health. So measure number six, in knowing who, then you can funnel the information to the respective boss in the company. Then we come to measure number seven about acquiring WSH knowledge. So people in the top management, you may come from different backgrounds. You might have studied finance or accounting, uh, you might be in operations, you might um, be an engineer, but not everybody is going to come equipped with WSH knowledge. So in attending um, se uh, sessions like this, like what we're doing today, me talking to you about the ACOP, you're acquiring knowledge about WSH. You can also subscribe to our wish bulletin because the council is, uh, we're constantly churning out uh, content about WSH. And then measure number seven is to en conduct engagement. So not only do you wait for information to be funneled to you, you also go out and talk to your people, talk to your employees, you have lunch with them during coffee break, you meet them in the pantry, find out, um, do side walkabouts, and then you, you talk to these people a little bit like how um, you have your your MP coming to coming to round the uh, knock on your door and they talk, talk to you, oh, is there any problem in your HDB that you're facing? Uh, is there anything I can help you with? So it's a little bit like that. So you don't want to just wait for information to come to you, you also want to engage them um, actively. <coughs> Measure number nine is about um, creating this ripple effect where um, the culture that you're setting goes beyond just your organization. So it's, you want to set and demand effective standards from those that you work with, your business partners, your suppliers, your manufacturers, your clients. So everybody is in this together. So for example, if you have a, a contractor coming into your workplace, you want to make sure that their employees have the same culture inculcated in them so they behave the same way that your employees do when it comes to safety and health. So we're done with the second principle, moving on to the third. It's about reviewing your WSH management system to make sure they remain highly effective. So it's not just implementing a system and just um, hoping that it will work. You have to conduct audits to make sure that they, they stay effective. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Then we come to measure number 11 about risk assessment. So you want to make sure that it's done suitably and adequately. Like I mentioned in the case earlier, when cracks were developing, something should have been done because it signals that something's wrong, you need to fix it, you need to address it ASAP. 
Measure number 12 and 13 are about your workers and they are two sides of the same coin. So number 12 is where you want to recognize good workers. So we have um, like the award winners earlier, um, this form of recognition is going to encourage them to keep doing what they do and measure number 13 is the opposite. So once in a while you're going to come, to come across employees who are slightly more recalcitrant, you know, in, in, in order to be more productive they might choose to do something unsafe and uh, you, want to, you want to address that particular behaviour so that it doesn't become ingrained in your other workers. So if someone is choosing to do something unsafe, you don't want, it to, you don't want other people, other employees to pick up the same bad habit. So you can either counsel them and if need be, um, meet up more, more severe measures to prevent that, uh, to, to nick that in the butt. Then we come to empowering workers. So you got to make sure that your workers have the knowledge, they are aware what are the hazards and what are the new hazards and what to look out for, right? And then you have measure number 15 where you set up a reporting system, you want to encourage proactive reporting. So that's what our niche campaign is about this year. You want people who are working on the ground to be your eyes and your ears to look out for, for hazards, look out for dangers, protect one another from, from, from um, getting, into, getting into an accident. So, um, as a leader, you have a you real significant influence in, in, in reassuring your employees that whenever they report, it will be fine because they're not going to get penalized for it. In fact, they're doing the company a favor. They're helping employees. My last two measures. Measure number 16 is about committing resources and protected time. So whenever your workers are scheduled for training, send them. Don't wait or procrastinate or, or, or postpone the training just because you're short of manpower because when your workers can pro, um, perform their work safely, that's when you're operating optimally. And measure number 17 is to involve your workers whenever you're developing initiatives for them. You want to keep them in the conversation. You want to involve them early in the brainstorming stage when you're when you tying down, when you're um, um, sorting out the, the details because these are the ones that you are implementing for and they are the ones who are exposed to the hazards daily so they would know best whether something implemented would work for them or not. So in conclusion, um, this document recognizes that every company will be unique. You have a different spread of um, workers, um, the, the, the demographic, the profile of every company will be different. You have different number of employees and the nature of work is also different. So don't be so fixated on the 17 measures. In fact, if you can do something else to a similar or better effect, go ahead. Because the idea here is to, is to follow the four principles, C-O-R-E, rather than go about it in a checklist manner. So a bit of advertising. So with this QR code, you can download the ACOP, which is bundled together with the FAQ. So if you've got questions, just take a peek at the, just skim through the FAQ and see if we've already have those questions answered. And be safe. Of course, uh, um, aside from be safe, we also have PhotoSafe, the booth over there. So if you have not heard of this program, please approach council staff. And finally, there's this top executive WHH program, which was launched last month. So um, you can think of it as an augmented business level one where elements of the ACOP, what I'm talking about right now, has been incorporated into the Be Safe workshop. So uh, it's going to be uh, compulsory for some industries, but I do highly encourage every uh, boss, if you're not a boss, go back and tell your boss that they should attend this program. Thank you. Mr. Vincent Pham, Deputy Chairman of the HHS Council, Mr. Salison, Commissioner of the Health, Mr. Dave Ng, Chairman of the HHS and Transport Committee, as well as SLA. A good morning to all, ladies and gentlemen. I'm quite well aware that I'm standing between you and the tea break. Hence, I will make it a chop-chop quick, quick update to this new revised uh, guideline on safe loading and unloading of the vehicles. 
The guideline was actually developed in 2010 and was actually updated in, uh, again in 2017. However, with the recent spate of uh, vehicle accidents uh, involving loading and unloading, there was a renewed emphasis on this topic again. Hence, Dave instructed the Logistics and Transport Committee to review this and take a look at whether can we improve it further to help the industry. And at this point, I'd like to recognize and thank the previous work group from the 2010 and 2017 for the tremendous work done because as the current work group is looking at it, we still find that the guideline is extremely comprehensive and still all encompassing. And it just needs a bit of updating to meet the current requirements and also the reinforcement, uh, which I will share later in the subsequent slides. Okay, so, so this is the current work group formed in the late uh, 2021, and uh, we can see it's very well supported and well represented from the logistics and transport industry, and also supported by MOM, LTA, Council, as well as uh, Singapore Safety, of Safety Officers. This new revision will not have happened without a strong contribution and support. I'm sure some of the previous uh, work group members are also present today. So please, I think give the present and the former work group a round of applause for the work, please. Okay, the next few slides will capture the seven points that um, changes that we made to the revised guideline. Certain topics such as the risk management was aligned with the new revised code of practice for risk management. The code of practice for risk management was revised and updated in late 2021. And one of the key ideas was consider the personal health, personal uh, risk, as well as the uh, human factors into the risk assessment, as well as communicating the risk and hazard clearly to, to the working team. This is very relevant to the logistic and the transport industry, as we can all agree that transport operator, logistic personnel are exposed to long working hours, late nights, and a lot of physical stress and combated by aging of course. Under chapter 2.2, we have included new common hazards as, as such as looking for hazards in driveways, hazards associated with dog travelers, tailgates, which will include the pinch point, the three and four type of hazards. And as to align the updated code of practice, for risk management, we included cycles, social and health related hazards. This will allow companies, management, or workplace safety health officers to be more aware of these hazards and take measures such as health surveillance to protect their workforce. We have tried to make the guidelines as user friendly as possible, so companies and supervisors, as well as our workplace safety and health officers, can use the guideline as a toolbox meeting material or a quick reminder for their staff. One example is this page, which is a summary of the tips for safe loading and loading in chapter two. So the management or the workplace safety health officer can give very, can give very quick reminders to transport operators and drivers of what to look out for and what to do. Safe refuge was also something new that we included in chapter two to remind drivers to stay at a safe location or on ground away from vehicles as a very practical. I mean, this is related to some accidents that have happened previously. A major addition to the revised guideline is the formation of a delivery plan. We are introducing the concept and the need to have a delivery plan device for delivery jobs. And this is similar to having a traffic management plan or a safe dating plan, where the forward planning of the work to be done and considering all the hazard mitigation. Okay, before everybody starts jumping, I just want to stress this is still a recommendation. And as a aid to companies and uh, workplace safety health officers or supervisors, this is not a law yet. Okay, so don't, don't be too worried. This is a sample of a delivery plan template. The template has been delivery kit 
as simple and easy as possible for the ease of use. So transport operators and staff can actually easily use them and actually understand them. So this is the revised copy of the new guideline. And this is a QR code to follow them. I believe that's not mentioned. Somebody mentioned that the, this device code should be inside the plastic bag or the paper bag. All right? Okay. So, fish on jump. This is the end of my presentation. How's everyone doing? Well, yeah, very good morning to Mr. Vincent Pang, Deputy Chairman, Workplace Safety and Health Council. Mr. Dave Ng, Chairman, Workplace WSH Council for Logistics and Transport Committee. Distinguished guests, fellow speakers, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honoured and glad to be given this opportunity to be here this morning to lend some perspectives on how we approach safety at FedEx Singapore. Before I begin, allow me to share with you a little bit background about FedEx in Singapore. FedEx started its operations in Singapore in, back in 1984. And just less than three months ago, in fact on April 17 this year, we celebrated our 50th anniversary worldwide. In Singapore today, we operate out of our main facility at Airport Logistics Park Singapore, or ELPS, which houses our South Pacific Regional Hub. Now, we have uh, over 1,200 dedicated team members based out of Singapore, and we operate uh, more than 60 FedEx flights in and out of Singapore each week handling more than 50,000 packages a day with a ground fleet of uh, more than 300 vehicles. We pride ourselves on having a very unique setup which encompasses a true end-to-end -end operations incorporating RAM or aircraft handling, sort, in-house clearance capability and ground operations under one roof. Since our establishment in 1973, the ongoing of success of FedEx has been driven by our strong culture. As an MD of FedEx Singapore, it brings me great joy to share that we have been certified great place to work, securing the fifth position amongst the best places to work in Singapore. And to add on, we have also been recognized as one of the top 15 best employers in Singapore by the Straits Times for the second year in a row and uh, we also top the uh, segment for transportation and logistics sector. I will now provide a glimpse into the drivers that shape our culture. At FedEx, we firmly believe that uh, the greatest asset is our people. Over 50 years ago, this belief inspired the creation of our iconic people service profit philosophy or internally known as a PSP philosophy, which is built on the principle that by creating a positive work environment for employees, they will then provide better service quality to the customers, which in turn would lead to stronger business results for the company. By upholding these values of PSP, we maintain the delicate balance between people, service and profit that fuels our continued success for the company. At FedEx, employees are united by the Purple Promise, a commitment to make every FedEx experience outstanding. This promise guides everything we do on a daily basis across the company and sets the bar for service excellence. It differentiates FedEx from the rest, earns the trust and loyalty of the customers and makes FedEx an even better place to work. Finally, Quality-driven management of QDM as we know it internally is a unique FedEx approach to continuously enhance our business processes. 
It empowers all FedEx team members to be architects of greater change and this has resulted in the company generating cost savings, revenue growth and improved customer experiences. I will now share a little bit more about our approach to safety. At FedEx, safety above all is something that we take very seriously. In fact, it is a top priority across our company and our day-to-day -day work. And in every opportunity that our top leadership and top management has to address the team, you know, safety, the message of safety is always incorporated in the sharing and messaging. To ensure that we maintain a safe environment for all employees, we have implemented various safety initiatives, including but not limited to the following. Skip level meetings are typically quarterly closed door discussions with employees, and these are checked by the next level manager. Meaning for an employee is the having a skip level meeting with the, with the manager's boss. Such meetings provide the opportunity for our employees to voice their concerns about the work in the absence of the immediate superior. When necessary, health and safety representatives will also be invited to attend these sessions if there are health and safety issues to be discussed and addressed. Work group meetings are manager-led communication sessions with direct frontline employees. Its purpose is to provide updates and to listen to any concerns relating to their work. Once again, uh, health and safety uh, representatives will also be invited when necessary. Pre-work briefing sessions, or commonly known as uh, toolbox meetings sessions, are also conducted on a daily basis for our frontline team members before the start of each work shift. Such briefings are led by operations managers with safety being the first item on the agenda and safety messages being reinforced and reiterated on a daily basis to drive home the message of safety above all. Regular inspections of all FedEx facilities are also conducted by our safety uh, committee members which consists of both management representatives and frontline team members. Finally, the active engagement of, with our frontline employees by our health and safety department representatives where they proactively interact with frontline team members to listen and understand the concerns with regards to safety related matters on the ground. When it comes to safety, everyone from the top management right down to the frontline team members on the ground in FedEx are expected to play their part in maintaining a safe work environment for everyone. Personally, I also conduct facility walkabouts at least once a quarter and sometimes if I can find the time, even uh, I, I, I try to do it on a weekly basis as much as possible, accompanied by our health and safety uh, reps. This allow me to gain a first-hand understanding of the ground concerns such as engaging the frontline team members to better understand their concerns on the ground in an informal setup and as well as having a better insights and appreciation of the overall sentiments on the ground. At FedEx, we also actively practice our open door policy, which means that any frontline team members or employees have the freedom to approach any member of management at any time to share their concerns, their feedback, their recommendations to improve work processes, including safety related matters, and basically anything relating to them in the, at the workplace. We also actively promote uh, frontline team members to provide recommendations and suggestions to improve the overall improvement and safety standards. I also conduct uh, ad hoc observations to ensure the safety processes we have implemented are being well documented and upheld and uh, anything that requires uh, corrective actions are reported in our action management program which I will touch on in the next slide which is the final slide. So in terms of feedback pathways, you know we have uh, multiple uh, approaches to that. Employee feedbacks are crucial aspects in maintaining a safe work environment. 
and it is a must that employees can freely express their thoughts and concerns without fear of repercussions. And I think that is uh, truly the uh, theme and topic for today's uh, session. But as such, you know, at FedEx, we have created multiple channels and uh, for employees to share their feedback, including but not limited to the following. At the corporate level, we have we have established and provide a 24/7 uh, alert line for employees to report workplace any workplace concerns anonymously. All employee feedback are valued and treated in full confidence and in confidence. Uh, in, uh, with a confidentiality. So uh, when the feedback is provided as such, you know, somebody will be uh, tasked to look into it and uh, eventually we will provide a close look feedback to the uh, team member who provided the feedback. We also have established an annual anonymous survey to gather employees' feedback on the management team and on the company's uh, direction and internally we call that a survey feedback action and I'm sure that uh, on the floor today, you know, a lot of us, we do have uh, in our companies a uh, similar feedback mechanism such as uh, 360 feedback. So uh, we want to gather the feedback about the company's uh, direction and management, the culture and, and basically to solicit any areas of feedback for improvement. Results are analysed and action plans are developed as a team to respond to the feedback. Finally, our action management program, as shared in the previous slide, it, also, it, is a, it is a more of a formal way to provide employees with an internal reporting channel to address unsafe work practices and conditions. These are prominently displayed in terms of our QR codes you know, around our facilities and employees can simply uh, provide, scan it and provide the feedback anytime and the management will look into it to address all these uh, ideas raised or concerns shared by the employees. Right, so I, I hope that uh, this uh, last uh, few minutes and this last few contents in the last few slides have uh, provided you a better insight and better understanding and appreciation of uh, how FedEx as a company, how we bring our safety above all uh, approach to life. So once again, uh, thank you for your time and attention and for giving me this opportunity to share some insights with you this morning. Thank you, I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, just to pose a question for the panelists, we will ask you to scan the QR code on displayed on screen or go to pigeonhole.at and enter the passcode WSHFLT2023. Next, we would like to invite Mr. Bobby Chiu, Head of Human Resource from Woodlands Transport Holding Private Limited. Mr. Chiu joined Woodlands Transport in December 2014 with more than 20 years of experience in labour relations, human resource management, workforce services, learning and development. Throughout his career, he continues to learn to develop his expertise through the full spectrum of HR management as a HR generalist. He strongly believes in, in the value of the HR function to motivate and engage employees towards continuous improvement. He also served as a member on the WSH Council Logistics and Transport Committee from 2019 to 2022 representing Willis Transport. Good morning. Everybody okay? So good morning bosses, sister, brothers, everybody. I'll cut out a short uh, salutation because uh, I was informed that my role is to represent the workers, right? So I'll just call you bosses, right? Uh, first thing first, I'd like to clarify why I put a bracket next to your safety health at work. Uh, it's a singular reference. I'd like to take a collective approach because safety is not just the worker's responsibility, it's the boss's responsibility, it's the stakeholder's responsibility, and it's also the customer's responsibility. By the way, FedEx is a transport customer. <laughs> so I must speak carefully, yeah? Um, okay, you may be wondering just now during introduction, um, my profession is human resources, 
right? Uh, but yet today, I'm here standing to share with everybody and also to learn with everybody about safety. And I'd like to just share a story. Why is Bobby talking about safety whereas it's HR? Because safety means lives. And in my 25 to 30 years career, I've forgotten how long I work in HR already, by the way. I have given out numerous checks. You know checks? Those that you can go to the bank and get money. It's not to the workers, but to the family. To the children, to the spouse, to the mother and father. So I tell myself this question. Will this money be better spent in sustaining the lives of my workers rather than just paying annual premium and get a check to pay to my workers? The answer is obviously no. The other thing is uh, recently, I just want to share, I have to send one of my workers back to India because uh, it's not work related, but because he has a heart condition. So today when we talk about health and safety, let's not restrict it to at work. It is also off work. Because an employee is an employee to my company and I don't care whether it's at work or not at work because it's part of a wooden transport family. For reference, uh, Wooden Transport is going to celebrate 50 years of anniversary next year. You are welcome to join us as a customer. And uh, why we're so, so passionate about safety is because our founder started with one bus as a bus driver. During those days, there's no such thing as regulated working hours. It's seven days, 24 hours. And typically, you will sleep in a bus for the first pickup point for the customer next morning. And if you watch some video in the YouTube, uh, you will sense that even the doctor don't see the father for many years. And that's why the doctor decided to join the company, because he dead the father every day. I go straight to the point. I'd like to share a little bit about feedback. Um, why this slide came about is because, remember COVID? Everybody know COVID or not? Is COVID good or not? No good, right? Cannot eat, must stop out, right? COVID taught us a lot of things. And this slide came to wooden transport during COVID whereby we found that we lost a lot of touch with my drivers, particularly. And for that matter, wooden transport is definitely a transport company. So we are not dealing with a bunch of workers in a plant in a stationary location. They are all over Singapore. By the way, we have uh, 1,400 pieces of mechanized and non-mechanized vehicles. So it's not possible for me to have something like this. Everybody sit down and listen to me talk. So um, how to get feedback effectively from my drivers particularly, and my only concern is drivers. Just now Vincent was mentioning about his worry every day about the well-being, right? You can bet I'm even more worried because each of my drivers travel at least six to eight trips per day, and you can just multiply by the number of drivers, check out the defect per million, right? But even a single accident, if it's life at loss, I think it's very serious. And let's be very clear about this. We are not just talking about Singaporean. We are talking about foreigners as well. We must value both as important. Why feedback is important? Because if the bosses don't get the feedback. Where do you think the worker will feedback to? The Cheng Kung Road. Right now. So we have one occasion whereby we have very good friends from MWM visiting wooden transport very often. And sometimes the feedback they give us, we are very surprised. How come MWM is so familiar with operation? The answer is very simple. Because somebody tell them about operation in wooden transport. And we took action to address that. And we must respect that if the drivers have genuine concern but they are not able to get escalation in terms of action to be taken, they will take their own action. And that's precisely, I think, we don't want to bother the MOM so much, we have to take personal responsibility. Employers are even superior than MOM because you know why? MOM can charge you, can put it out of business, can stop an order.
because he just doesn't want to be known that he's a complainant. Now, the other thing why I emphasize about feedback is positive because we need to understand feedback can be good news and also bad news. Am I right? We don't want to always listen to problems. We also want to listen to celebrations, good sharing. So please take note when we talk about feedback here, don't just have a, what do you call that, some media to say, oh, how to complain about this, how to complain about that. Also emphasize on compliments. I must expect compliments. But sometimes, you know, as a Chinese company, yeah, our bosses is pretty conservative in complimenting. Because you know why? Bobby, don't tell people that our safety is very good. Huh? Because sometimes once you tell their safety is very good, huh, then the safety problem come in, you know. Uh, like I say, oh, very good, that's how the accident come. It's because Bobby say no accident, that's why I got accident. Huh? Something like that, you know what I mean? Okay, the other thing is truthful feedback require action and immediate response. But sometimes this action may not resolve all the problems. Just an example, I'm sure down here have husband, and wife, mother and father, isn't it? So when your wife is not so happy about you, do you think your wife will tell you exactly what you did wrong? She will just give you the face. Right? So you thought, oh, I've forgotten about anniversary present. But actually that is not the reason. Because you have not been coming back for dinner every night. You have been saying, please do that, you didn't do that. Just joking, yeah, sir? Okay, um, next, I'd like to share something. I think when feedback, we are talking about corrective actions. We are not just treating feedback as a complaint or as a statement or something to wake us up. Certain corrective actions ought to be taken. This is what I expect when we talk about feedback. Second thing is to be alert on safety. It is not requiring corrective action, but danger is coming. For that matter, I think most of you here recognizes wooden transport as a bus transport company, but most of you here doesn't know that we operate prime mover activities with loads ranging from 40, 50, 60 to 70 tons. And we do have potholes on the road because when you talk about heavy tonnage doing a turn, uh, the road surface will get compromised. And sometimes we need really our workers to tell us because as drivers, they are on the road, who else can know better about safety than our own drivers, you tell me? Right? So tell you say, Bobby, do something about the road because when I'm doing the turning radius, I felt that it's a bit bumpy. And just now somebody was, Mr. Saleh, right? Talking about forklift. Yeah? Forklift travel on the same road as heavy vehicle, but a pothole will be very dangerous to them. The third part is, sustaining safety. We are not here just to score point to say this year our KPI reaches and all good. Um, the reason why I was brought into WSAC is because of uh, late Mr. Tan Kui Him. Remember him from PSA? He told me he drove safety campaign in PSA for a good 10 years. Sat near 10 years. What does that mean? It means to say it takes time. And sometimes when you think that you're doing very well, problems start to cops up because environmental changes, technology changes, workflow changes. So you cannot think that just safety because you reach a KPI is okay. Especially for urban transport, I don't know about business owner like you, a lot of business operations change after COVID, isn't it? So we need to adapt to our safety rules according to such changes. And to sustain safety, therefore, you have to continue to review, even though you think that it is okay. Last but not least, this brings me to the point of continuous improvement and learning from near misses. I must say, we transport as a local company. We don't have a lot of resources to hire experts and all this, but we do value near misses. And near misses means accident haven't happened, but we need to take precautions. We have the spirit of management support and harmonious teamwork. What does it mean? Because when it comes to feedback, it's not talking about promoting blame culture. Every time an accident is driver's fault. Driver's fault. Any public transport operator here? Wow, wow, Mr. Tana. Tapai gets the driver's Huh? That's why you've got proper hiring drivers, huh? right? But please, the next thing is that it's the mechanic fault because never serviced my vehicle properly. 
Am I right? So our culture here is we don't focus on the person. We focus on the problem and solve the problem. So my bosses, Mr. Albert Lee, Ms. Wu Chun Ning, have this spirit. When problem comes, let's not do finger pointing. We look at the problem and solve it. One of the very common problem of drivers is this. Brake wei jia, you know what I mean? The brake is not working. Although at HR, I learned a few things about mechanical. So I asked, what is the braking distance? Do you keep the safety distance or not? So when you say brake wei jia, it's a very serious thing, you know? Is MOM here, by the way? MOM, do you do a regular maintenance of your braking system? Do you have a speed limiter? All the jargon will come in, right? So first thing first, when we hear drivers saying this, the first thing first is that we send our vehicle to our test center to test the brake and to refute back to the drivers. And you know what we ask the drivers to do? If it's really brake effective, you pay the cost of the testing. Because we don't want people to start alleging things that's not true. Daily personnel. The daily safety personnel in Woolen Transport is Bobby Chu. Care to work with Woolen Transport. If every day you woke up at 5 30, you'll receive a safety message from me to remind. I'm almost like a pastor, right? Preaching the Bible. It's very, very boring. Yes, I know. But that's exactly, I behave like my wife. Every day telling me to come back to eat at home. And somehow or other, after a while, 50 years joyfully with God's grace, we will continue to sustain a good performance for safety. And my slogan under our mission statement is, we want to provide a safe, reliable and pleasant journey. This is the ethos by our company because we do ferry school children. We ferry many different types of employees and staff. And please take note, safety is not a good to have. It's a must have. With that, thank you very much. Thanks for your patience. Anything I say wrong, I am not sharing. I'm free to talk later. Uh, other than that, come see We say, I'm Chen Di Yi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Next, we will have Dr. Victor Sia, Acting Director, Center of Excellence for Behavioral Insights at Work, Singapore University of Social Sciences. Dr. Victor Sia is the Acting Director in NUSS, sorry, U, SUSS. His work focuses on the application of psychology and behavioral science to change behaviors and shift mindset at the workplace. An experienced corporate trainer and executive coach, Victor currently leads applied research and conducts uh, projects with public and private sector entities, including several large Singapore logistic and transport companies. Dr. Sia, please. So I'm, I'm here to share the academic point of view. Um, so so uh, really my presentation today is, I'd like to start off with something that might be a bit surprising, right? Which is um, that safety, uh, speaking up is a risky behavior. Right, so we want people to speak up, but we first have to acknowledge that speaking up is a risky behavior, okay? Uh, and, and we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so here's the academic perspective. Um, so if you look at safety voice, which is really speaking up for safety, uh, what we are looking for is employee voice, so employers, employees talk, speaking up. And then the next thing is we want employees to be citizens of our companies. Right? So not just coming here for work, but also feeling like they're part of the company. So in order to have safety voice, we need to have employee voice and citizenship behavior. So really it's quite a big ask. Uh, I just want to point out that actually it is quite a complicated thing. Um, so when we say safety boys, we are talking about things like that, right? Like uh, reporting on others, even when others disagree, right? We are talking about uh, raising concerns, telling my boss, my supervisor. So I think you can see that safety voice is actually quite risky, right? And I think the other thing that also we should keep in mind is that it is not only risky, uh, it is also an extra role behavior. Okay, so speaking up is not part of my job. Right? If I'm just strictly following my job, I don't necessarily have to speak up. 
right? So I think just to keep this in mind, right? So when we want to encourage people to speak up, we're really asking for two things. We're asking for people to take a risk, which is a bit ironic, uh, and we're also asking people to do something extra. Okay. So why talk about safety voice? Uh, I think a few things is uh, underreporting is high, right? So some studies have found 50 to 80 percent of underreporting, which is a large, large, large percentage. Um, I think it's also a leading indicator of your organizational health. So if your company is doing well, your workers will actually have safety voice. So it's a leading indicator. Okay? Um, for Singapore, we have a lot of migrant workers. If you think of uh, safety voice, I'll just go back a couple of slides. Uh, attempts to change rather than escape from an objectable state of affair. Right? So what that means is that instead of escaping, right, so quitting the company, uh, they have to, they are staying to change, right? So for many of our migrant workers, that's really one of their only options, right? Uh, many of them, they find it hard to leave, right? So it's very important for them to have a safety box. And then finally, obviously, there's clear evidence for effectiveness. I'll give you one very dramatic example. Uh, this is in 2011, uh, research by two economists uh, for uh, mini buses in Kenya. Um, so, so Kenya obviously is quite far, and, but I want you to focus on the, the sort of a bit dramatic title, which is $7,000 to save uh, 1,200 years of life. So what they did was quite clever, they pasted a sticker in the buses, uh, in all these mini buses, uh, saying that, you know, don't just sit there as you drive dangerously, stand up, speak up now, okay? So this is safety voice for the consumer, okay? Uh, but just having this, and they compared 2,000 different uh, mini bus, right? Mini buses. Okay, and they found that buses with that sticker had an accident rate or insurance claim rate of five percent. Those that didn't have the sticker had an insurance claim rate of ten percent. And so with that, so basically we cut accident claims by half just by having a sticker. Okay, uh, and then obviously you know based on the uh, insurance claim difference, you can actually extrapolate, you can calculate how many years of life you save. Uh, just with $7,000 to paste the stickers in 1,000 minibuses. So I think this is a, a very good example of the importance of safety voice. Yeah. So I, obviously as a researcher, as an academic, I, I obviously have to uh, acknowledge there are many limitations. I think there's a few, right? So first of all, uh, a very recent review of 48 articles found that um, really the research is quite new, okay? So about 40 out of 48 studies uh, are published in 2009 onwards. Uh, very Western-centric, so uh, almost, almost all are in Western world. Uh, I think only two was in Asia. Uh, and very healthcare-centric. Again, about 80 odd percent of studies were actually done with healthcare workers. Um, but having said that, I think there's some things that we can take from here. Um, so one of the things is, uh, what do we need for safety boys? I think leadership is very important, obviously. Uh, you know, uh, everyone here is, is uh, this is a very uh, good platform to share this. I, I think the only thing about leadership is that it's indirect. Uh, so leadership's role on uh, safety voice is indirect. So you know, leaders can't go in and say, okay, everybody talk about safety, right? That, that doesn't work. Uh, studies have found that leadership uh, creates the conditions for safety voice to occur. So I think that's the first thing. Psychological safety is this sense that in my group, I can take risks. Right, so I can, in my meeting, I can suggest an idea, I can talk to my bosses, and that's very important for speaking up. Um, I think some of the points raised earlier, job demands, job resources, right? If your demands are so high that you really don't have energy and time to uh, speak up, uh, then there's no chance that your workers are going to speak up, right? So we need to think about what are we demanding from our workers and whether they have the resources to speak up. Uh, the last point there is about trust and power. Uh, so I think very importantly for trust, there's two types of trust. There's effective trust and there's cognitive trust. So cognitive trust means I trust my leader's judgment. I think he's capable, I think I can believe him. Right? Effective trust on the other hand is I feel, I feel my leader cares for me. And that's a very big difference. And studies have found that actually effective trust, the idea that your, your leader likes and cares and wants to you know, uh, make sure that you are well, that, that the feeling of affection is actually more important. So I, I want to end with just three points, uh, again based on the studies. Um, I think the first thing is really to make it easy, right? So when we, when I think when uh, Eric uh, talked about, you know, the, the helpline, uh, the call line, is the, sorry, not the call, the 24 hour uh, line that you can call, right? We're trying to make it easy for people to speak up, 
right? So I think that's the first thing. You, you need to make it easy. So you need to think of when you should ask these questions. When will workers be more willing to tell you about safety concerns? Is it after a shift, during a shift? I think we need to time this, right? Rather than once a year, you know, where, where, where everyone has forgotten all the safety issue, we need to find the right time to ask, okay? Uh, the next is to reduce the risk, right? So um, again, safety voice is a risky thing, right? I have to tell my boss that, oh, you know, something's happening. And my boss might think I'm criticizing him, right? So how do we reduce that risk? So how do we get workers to feel like, oh, it's okay, it's very safe here, I, I feel safe, and so there's a lot of issues about psychological safety. Uh, the final thing there, I think is, uh, again, I think Bobby and, and Eric talked about, right, is this idea that uh, feedback is only useful when people feel like it's going to be act on. So the last thing is to get workers to believe that when they give you their, their safety voice, that something will happen out there. Uh, so I think those are sort of three takeaways uh, that I have for you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Good morning. You are all going to be rewarded, all right? Because this is an amazing panel, and I saw so many questions coming in. So first of all, let me say thank you very much, all right? All of you spoke with passion, and I love it that we have big companies like FedEx and slightly smaller companies like Woodlands Transport, and a very passionate uh, psychologist speaker. Because many of the questions that you've actually sent over hit it on the nail, all right? Many of you are actually very much aligned to the idea that we take ownership of work safety. And I like it that Bobby said, beyond work, because this is a person, and whether it's within the work that you're looking at the safety of health. So there is one question that has just come up and I'm going to go straight to them because a lot of you have sent in. We have a total of nine questions here. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to jump in anytime when I just uh, say this question has five votes. Okay, and therefore because it's got five votes, I'm going to honor the moderator's role. So the question is, what would be a good number of health and safety personnel deployed in the company versus total number of employees? Eric, you want to try this one? And you don't worry, we got no pass or fail, and we all got A's. Okay, Eric, yes. Yeah, I'm not aware of, uh, you know, for, for example, at FedEx, right, we, we don't necessarily have a quota or a formula to calculate that. Right, so, so definitely uh, we do have a team of uh, health and safety specialists working alongside me. So how many are there of the HSE staff? Uh, currently we have a team of about uh, five based out of Singapore. Okay, and that's for 1,200 staff? That's right. Okay. I remember my numbers and huh? the finance part. Okay. So, so I, I, I think the number is not so important for me because uh, I think as some of the uh, speakers have alluded to earlier, and you know, safety is everybody's business, right? So I, I think the, the main idea is that uh, everybody takes ownership and takes an interest in safety, be it the frontline employee, the frontline supervisors, the line managers, all the way to the top management. So I think. The way that we see it at FedEx is that these are health and safety specialists, these are subject matter experts, these are our business partners that, that are around to guide us along, to provide us with that support, that advisory kind of uh, support. But ultimately, everybody needs to take ownership and everybody needs to take an interest. I love the answer. And now, Bobby, you want to jump in here? Is there something like, you know, uh, work safety employees in your organizations? Or like, Eric, everybody should take ownership? Uh, sometimes everybody becomes nobody. Right? Um, so, yes, we encourage all our drivers, uh, as well as supervisors, to take the responsibility. Uh, yes, on an ongoing basis, every month we do have a WSS meeting that the group MD as well as deputy MD, financial controller sits together with supervisors, uh, functional representative I must say, right? 
And uh, sometimes, because I'm the leader of the WSH, uh, so sometimes I'll penalize my boss even if he doesn't turn up for this uh, meeting. Because uh, sometimes the figure is very important, right? So I must say it's not a number. And uh, the other thing is really, do we just have number for the sake of number? The question is, what is the issue that you need to discuss? So we keep the meeting within one hour, chop chop, finish. However, sometimes when there is a critical event, right, such as during COVID, we escalated it to twice uh, monthly, means within a month twice, right? And even sometimes there's once, because uh, there was one occasion our wheels fly out, right? I mean, I'm truthful, right? We have been in the transport company for 50 years, cannot be no problem, right? So uh, we have to escalate and then uh, we, uh, we don't want to jump into quick solution, right? Because sometimes quick solution can only cover certain things but don't solve certain things. Yeah, so I wouldn't have a number in place, uh, but uh, representation from the department and subject matter expert is very important for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have anything to add, Victor? No, okay, good. I'm going to take this question next. All right, um, Bobby mentioned about near misses, and I know that, you know, we want to be proactive, we don't want to be reactive, yeah? So, you know, near misses, how do we encourage employees to start reporting near misses? I'm going to hold the two, all right, bosses, I'm going to jump to Victor. So, Victor, you talked a lot about safety within the organisations, where people feel safe to bring up problems, um, how do you create that kind of uh, psychological safety in an organization? I, I, th I think this is a, one of the most common questions, right? So when we talk to business owners, the first thing is, how do I get workers to own safety? You know, it's all that ownership, right? So you can have body cameras, you can have AI, you can have all that, but ultimately, uh, if they don't own it, then I think we have, we have issues. Um, so I, I, I think uh, there's no easy answers, sadly, uh, right? So, so, but it, I think uh, Bobby uh, was talking about uh, fighting for uh, PSA, uh, push driving safety for 10 years, right? So it's a long, arduous process, but I think we need to focus on a few things. One is creating conditions where people feel safe. Uh, that's really important, right? So uh, anonymity, you know, having that hotline, being able to report anonymously, uh, I think that's very crucial. Okay? Um, but I also want to suggest that the other thing, which is what I was alluding to earlier, is very important for workers to feel like bosses care for them. Uh, and it's a bit, uh, maybe it's a bit like a psychologist to say this, but I think if workers care, uh, feel that the, the, the supervisors care for them uh, on a personal level, then they are actually willing to take that risk to, to speak up. Thank you. So, so can you tell us roughly, I'm not asking for your near misses, Right, but how do you encourage workers to report on near misses? Any one of you, Bobby and Eric. Talk less, do more. Means to say that when a feedback is given to you, you just have to take action. But you need to be careful. Once you take action, they start to trust you. Then there will be more feedback given to you. Right? Uh, this is the way I feel it. Uh, my ex bosses used to tell me, Bobby, when some people come up to give you feedback, and it means you got value, you know. The problem is that when they don't stop coming to you, then that's where the problem comes. Uh, so effective, uh, as to how to promote this, I just want to set an example. You go into a toilet, the light is not working. Is it a safety issue? Right? Okay. So. Why not working? Why not working? Now why? I start asking why, 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 then ask all the people responsible. But they say, say, boss, just get the bloody thing fixed. And that's it. When it's fixed, take a picture, sir. And you know what? The driver says, thank you very much, boss. Thank you. Come see That's it. You know, they don't have a lot of time to talk rubbish. You just want to solve the problem and that's it. Thank you. Eric? For us, we also have uh, another forum, you know, I, I did not mention earlier in, in the presentation that we have a forum or platform whereby we review all these uh, near misses or actual, actual accident cases, you know, in the form of a safety review board. So we draw the learnings from these uh, actual events or, case, or near misses uh, cases and then we actually take it to share it in the uh, pre briefing forum. Right, and, and obviously anonymously, you know, no names mentioned, but you know, we just wanted to take it as an opportunity to share the event. 
you know, in the name of uh, education, in the name of uh, gently remind, reminding all the people, they look out for this. You know, we have a near miss accident like that, and please be reminded. Right? And, and the message we always give our frontline employees is that come to come to work happy, say, uh, and go home safely and happily, right, to your family. So I like that because uh, earlier when you were going through the slide and saying that there are daily briefing, you know, I was thinking, do you repeat the same thing, you know, for your daily, like the examples where people actually report a near miss without names mentioned can be a learning moment for everyone in the organization, yeah? So this one, I think, is for you, Bobby, yeah? So how can companies effectively launch and sustain behavioral safety. You said that every day you got to send people, you know, like pastor like that. Guy, keep safe. I think there was one uh, American movie also, you know, the police patrols go up and then that was the message and the tagline. So how do you make it sustainable beyond Bobby? Somebody's got to do that reminder, huh? Then you, know, you tell everyone be like Bobby cannot be, right? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, because although I think today we see a lot of technology solution out there, the problem is what happens if I lose my handphone or I lost my computer. And that exactly happened to me when I we was having holiday in Switzerland. Uh, so automatically, my deputy take over, right? Because they know at certain time, it is just that at certain time your wife will ask you to go back for dinner, right? So for that day, how, how come there's no message from Bobby, you know? But I did inform some of them to say I lost my mobile phone and the second command come in, you know? As to your question whether we repeat or not, I'm a Christian by the way, we don't add or subtract any single verses from Bible. So the answer is yes, there are repeated uh, messages, sometimes it does, but don't repeat so much. Uh, I know sometimes it can be very boring though, reading the same thing, but that's exactly the point. I want to tell you until you do it. Thank you. Eric? Do you all do this? The sustained behavioral safety. I think you know it's quite easy to do it, you know, as a good initiative. But how to make sure that it's consistently practiced? Yeah, I think this is a as, as mentioned earlier by Professor, right? You know, it is a more of a we see it as a long term journey, right? You know, it, it's not as if you know we tell people to do it one time and they will be doing it. So I think it has to be a message consistently reminded, consistently put out there, and I think uh, to a large extent, uh, frontline employees they have to to have that trust in the management that you know we are not doing it for the sake of KPIs, we are doing it really you know for for the sake of keeping it having a safe workplace for everybody, and like I said earlier, come to work happy, go home safe. Right, so I think the trust part of it is a big part of it and I think having the right environment and encouraging people to do it and be looking out for not only themselves but for their colleagues. So Victor, I'm going to jump and... Uh, Can I jump uh, very quickly on this? Yes. yes. Uh, so I, I think uh, very importantly we need variability in a message. Right, so you can't be repeating the same message for three months. Uh, no one's going to listen. So, so I think it's very important to, to vary the message. I think those are some basic... Uh, then the other, I think, is try to have the message personalized. Uh, I, that's quite expensive, hard to do, but that's, I think those are a couple of things that would help. Thank you very much. Uh, someone here is definitely all right, thinking about the drivers. Okay, so drivers on road face constrained to speak up as traffic conditions all right, varies every day. How to develop an effective system in which drivers are conscious of, you know, there's a protocol, or is there no fixed system? Bobby, I'm looking at you. All your drivers, are, are they put on the same routes? No, right? No, we have timing routes. Um, so I, I don't get a question here. Can you repeat your question again? Sorry. So if the drivers are driving, you know, or there are people who are, remember the Kenya example mm -hmm. that uh, Victor mentioned, you know, mm. they use stickers to right. remind people. Yes. And we are telling a lot of people, if you see things on the bus that you're traveling in, yes. and you're not very happy with the drivers, but you don't want to tell the driver at that point in time, or should you tell the driver later? 
Or is there a way in which you could use this as a protocol to guide the driver? I mean, something standardized or something just proactive on the spot? Okay, um, I don't know whether I can answer this question effectively or not. I, I think what we are talking here about drivers is that we must trust that our drivers is a responsible and professional drivers. We agree. They are licensed, they do have a vocational license and do it. So, it is the best interest that the driver already have a logo by themselves to say they, 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 they ought to be safe. So the only thing else is that uh, because we work with this company called Yutong, it's a bus company by the way, we even think further to say that how can we spread this safety message to the family, to the wife, to the children. Because there were instances when accidents happened, the parents or even the family members don't know about what exactly the husband is doing, you know. So we need a lot of reinforcement from other people. It's, yes, I appreciate, sir, that the sticker will help. I will definitely think about it. Um, the thing is that they have to just go on the vehicle every day to start the engine, knowingly that safety is number one. That, that, that's, that's our point, right? Yeah. And recently, somebody was telling me, Bobby, can you please don't go so hard on safety, you know? Because now, labor crunch. My drivers need to work extra hours. And some of my uh, supervisors secretly telling me, Bobby, we are doing some speeding. And they are trying to justify to me because not enough drivers, so they have to rush. So when I listen to this, I need to empathize a little bit. Because in most of my transport drivers, they go by trip earning. The more they earn, is because the more trip they pay. I cannot be saying something whereby going against the nature of the job. But we need to remind them, is it worthwhile or not? You know what I mean? Uh, so it's very personal, right? Uh, I, I, don't, I cannot really answer your question, but this is the first thinking I thought to answer to the audience. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Robbie. I'm going to move to the question. Three votes, but it's still very relevant. Um, for Eric, yeah? How do you manage drivers' driving habits on the road? And, you know, many logistics and transport providers keep emphasizing reaching on time. Yeah, I'll begin the response to this question similar to what Bobby shared, right? So, you know, we, we also have, uh, sometimes when accidents happen, uh, the employee will come and say, Hey boss, you know, I, you know, the workload is so high, so we end up, you know, driving a little bit faster. So our response is always to them, right, that nothing should supersede safety, right? So, so, so no reason would be good enough to, to uh, justify that, right? Yeah. So do you all use outsource or you only use your own drivers? Well, we have a combination, we have a hybrid model, so we have uh, vendors doing the job for us and our own employees as well. Okay. So how do I also tell the vendors that this is the principle? How do I bring it upstream such that whatever third party we use, they abide by that same concept? Right, so earlier on I mentioned, you know, the pre-work briefings on, that carry out on a daily basis, the work group meetings, so, so, you know, we treat our vendors as our own employee, so whatever dissemination of messages, you know, they are always uh, kept in the same loop. Very nice. So I'm going to call this answer, I'm going to jump to you, Victor. There seems to be this recurring theme, you know, of whether we should encourage people to, you know, report unsafe, Will they become scrutinized or whistleblowing by their peers, by their management? Whistleblowing, should it be anonymous? Right? And then a follow-up on that. If, it, if you really need to collect the facts, how do you go about doing it without revealing the whistleblower? Um, I, I, I think sometimes it's impossible not to reveal uh, the person. Uh, and often I think that's one of the main reasons why people don't uh, whistleblow or they speak up, right? It's that, that risk. So uh, again, there's no easy answer, uh, but that creating that culture uh, 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 where you know, we expect uh, things to be reported, uh, but also providing individual support uh, to the whistleblower. So checking in with them. Um, so for example, if, if the supervisor, the person whistleblowing stays in the same dorm, right? Uh, then obviously, you know, you do need to 
follow that individual quite closely and monitor that person over the next few days after the facts are made known. Uh, so really very uh, individualized, I think, uh, would be the answer. What about the organizations uh, on the top media? Whistleblowing, um, you know, how effective is it within your own organization? Um, I, I think I, I can I can confess that sometimes the management are overly concerned about who is the one who whistleblow, rather than focusing on a problem. And when there's an anonymous feedback coming, they tend to guess, Bobby, is it this person? Is it that person? And they have the understanding thinking that they are not really talking about that problem. There are some grievances behind, but they use it as a pretext. So I said, look, focus on the problem, right? Solve the problem. But if after solving the problem, the complaints are not coming back, then you need to know that maybe there are bigger things behind, right? So the answer is yes, uh, that, that happened. Anonymity, as I mentioned. Uh, I, I must say that in my company, there are managers who disagree with me to say, Bobby, I'm not going to act of anything. So if you don't act, doesn't mean the head of HR don't act because you escalate to me. And if I don't act, you escalate to the MD. And after MD means what? Our brother MOM will come in, right? So that's it, right? So um, I, I, I must understand uh, my guidance. The other thing is about education. I think we are talking about awareness here, educating, giving them the safe comfort zone to, to say something freely. Uh, to tell the truth, we, we have a lot of uh, videos and cameras on the on the on the vehicle. Uh, the request from the drivers is this: uh, Bobby, it's okay for you to take out and share it because we do sharing. But mask up the person's face, mask up the vehicle number because you are not trying to criticize the person. You are just trying to show the incident, right? Respect the individual, and they are then therefore they are willing to help. Yeah, that will be my point. Very good. And I have a couple of specific questions for FedEx, yeah? <coughs> so, um, actually, for both, lah, how FedEx and Woodlands Transport Companies ensure that the head of departments take the lead and be responsible for safety? That it should not be the WSH train staff or anything like that, yeah? Any one of them? So, for example, at FedEx, right, one of our senior managers heading our ground operations, you know, he also heads the uh, QDST, right, the safety committee in short. So, you know, they, they do a lot of activities, you know, monthly meetings, quarterly facility inspections, they chair the safety re review board at least uh, once, if not twice a month, and they're also uh, responsible for crafting out the messaging for the daily briefing, se se briefing sessions, incorporating safety messages, so, so things like that. So it's uh, all led by ourselves. Okay. And not just because there's a WSH and staff down there. For you, Bobby? Uh, the first company I worked was a Japanese company. I mean, any Japanese company here. Because uh, there was one example that the factory caught fire. The protocol is that MD had to resign. The MD, the commander had to go, right? Um, so, in, in respect for, for the current context, we learn transport, whether the HOD, of course, we are talking about KPI, incentivize, we'll cut your bonus, this and that. Um, at the end of the day, it's still going back to just now in the room I mentioned. Can you answer to the family members of your employee if there's a fatal accident? You go and answer. Okay? That's my point. Don't ask each other to go, you go. You face the music. And if after facing a few times, you're still oblivious, uh, I think this person must be not human. Uh, yeah? And also my problem because I hired him, so probably have to fire him. Uh. Uh, so you have to be very clear that what we can do, what we cannot do. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm watching the clock because I promised the audience 12.30, so we are running a bit short. Firstly, a lot of requests for Victor's slide. But the reason is very simple, they all want to send it to their management team. Okay? So uh, I'm sure uh, WSH will apply. Right? If the more management we could influence, the better. So as a roundup, all right, one key takeaway that you'd like each of us in this room to take away from. I'm going to start with Victor. All right? So we go the other way around. Um, I, I hope this qualifies as one. Um, but I, I think uh, speaking up, uh, again, I, I think it's a risky 
uh, and an extra role behavior. I think that's the takeaway uh, that I like to just sort of shut that sweet, right? It's risky and it's an extra role behavior. So you do need other stuff, you know, uh, to support that. Thank you. Very good. So keep reminding everyone that it's your role to speak up, right? Bobby? Uh, don't have a blame culture. Safety, face it, handle it. Don't start blaming. Prevent rather than react. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bobby. Eric. For me, it would be uh, our, sl our slogan, safety above all. Right, so, so take ownership, take charge, and uh, one injury and one vehicle-related accident is one too many. Right, despite the KPIs, but I always tell our team, right, one accident, one exit, one injury is just one too many for us. Yeah, so just take charge. Thank you very much. I think from the wonderful panel here, you've actually just heard about action speaks louder than words, right? But keep reminding people that the speaking up is your responsibility and people at the call. That's the reason why we are all seated here. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad there are some ladies in the audience. And I'm going to hand over the mic to our MC, yeah, Joe. Can we put our hands together? I think now I'm